their day, and then the white throne judgment. I want you to come to, uh, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's go to Matthew chapter 24. We're talking about the judgments. Now, these are some of the things that have to do with sevens in your Bible. And right now, we'll get to the seven mysteries in a little bit. I know many of you are ready for me to get jumping on uh, Daniel, and that's coming. Uh, but these things are real important for you. And um, I don't know if she's here today or not. I can't, haven't scanned the crowd yet, but had a good question and question and answer on uh, Wednesday night in reference to Matthew chapter number 24. And uh, the things that go on in Matthew chapter number 24 have nothing to do with the rapture and nothing to do with the church age. Um, I probably should have taken the time to put the whiteboard up here and just to show you this, but you got to remember when the writing of Matthew 24 took place, there are no Pauline epistles that are present. And uh, so you can't get this idea in your mind that um, when Matthew's writing this, that it has anything to do with the rapture of the church. Why do you bring that up? Well, I bring that up for this reason. Right now, you're in a period of time where people are watching the events that are happening, everything from the Ukraine to Israel, Russian bear and China and all the other stuff going on and China, uh, Taiwan and that kind of thing. And those things are significant. You don't want to disregard that, but you can't read them into prophecy and then start reading into the book of Revelation. From Revelation chapter 4 all the way to Revelation 19, you're not there. Let me say that again. From Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 19, you as a church are not there. Amen. So when you have individuals that are trying to read everything from uh, uh, predicting who the next presidential candidate's going to be to who's going to be the Antichrist, you're not going to be here for that. The revelation of the Antichrist and everything that takes place, just hold on on Matthew 24. Come to 2 Thessalonians. Let me show you this. And I know this is new for some of you, and don't be uh, embarrassed if you don't grab it the first time around. It's like, uh, it's like going through the Old Testament and trying to find saved by grace through faith and uh, that kind of thing and getting saved by looking forward to the cross. And a lazy Bible student will say, okay, well, that's where it goes. It doesn't go there. You can't make that fit if you don't rightly divide it. But then you have to be careful on the flip side of that because a lot of the individuals that try to teach you that stuff are very strongly rooted in Calvinism. And so the next thing you know, you think, well, I get saved by works and kept by works, and if I don't work, it means I'm not, and all that kind of stuff. Listen, you get saved, that salvation belongs to Him, not you. He doesn't even put it in your hands to keep it. It's not in your hands to get it, and it's not in your hands to keep it. It's His. Even David says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. David says in Psalm 51, I pray you take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Would you agree King David was a great king? Would you, would you agree King David was a great king? <laughs> would you agree God liked David? Do you ever know what? David could lose the Holy Spirit and you can't. I mean, that shows you what the Lord thinks of you. The Lord fixes it that when you get saved, you get sealed. So no matter how dirty the jar gets, the beans are in good shape. Now, the misunderstanding also is, is in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, the word, the Antichrist shows up here. Uh, and he gets showed up, the son of man sin, son of perdition, and then everybody reads the next several verses as if it's going to take place before the rapture. It doesn't. Everything he refers to is the second advent and has to do with the tribulation. You're not going to be here for the tribulation. Look, let me show you. Come to Matthew, uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or cha yeah, 2. Look in verse number uh, 2. That ye not be soon shaken in mind or troubled, uh, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. And don't believe the notes in your Bible that says the day of Christ is the same as the day of the Lord. It's not. The day of Christ is the, is the rapture, not the tribulation. Now watch. Let no man deceive you that that means for that day, the day of Christ shall not come except there come a falling away first. Notice the comma. Now watch. And the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Oh, well, what that means is the church will see it. Well, you might, but that comma oftentimes separates a thousand years. As a matter of fact, in 2 Thessalonians 5, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, one comma separates uh, over a thousand years of history. So you have to be careful about that. So when he says the man of sin be revealed, well, he's going to be revealed to who? 
Does it mean he's going to be revealed to you? If you want to use John as a type of the church, I guess you could make that, and he did reveal himself to him. But you've got to remember, John's sitting at the table, and John's Jewish. So the man of sin be revealed, that may be revealed to the 144,000 male virgin Jews and Moses and Elijah who will know exactly who it is. They won't be fooled by it, but a multitude of other people will be. But revealed to you, I'll show you right now, uh, you know a lot about the Antichrist right now, don't you? You know who it is, don't you? It's a half-breed Syrian Jew. Laban's a picture of that. You know his name, Judas. You know his number, 666. You know his mark, it's a spot. You know his platform, peace and safety, signs, wonders, and miracles. You know a lot about the Antichrist. What's his name? Gorbachev. Well, that didn't work out. It's Reagan. Well, that one didn't work out. <laughs> well, it's Hitler. Uh, sorry, unless he's resurrected, we're in trouble there. See, always trying to decide who it is, it looks like that revelation takes place after you're out. Now, you may get uh, changed and all of a sudden the Lord will show it to you, but don't spend so much time looking for the Antichrist. The Bible says you're supposed to be looking up for Jesus Christ. Um, for you studying eschatology, prophetic events, I'm, that's great. That's wonderful. But prophetic events sometimes get you off of your personal relationship with the Lord. And you get to get so caught up in that kind of stuff, the next thing you know, your relationship with the Lord suffers. Now watch what happens and just start re reading in verse 4. He's going to tell you about the Antichrist, who opposes and exalted himself above all that is God and is worshipped, and that he is God, sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. You see that in verse 4? All right. That takes place in the tribulation. Are you here for that? You're not going to see him sit in the temple. You're not going to see him uh, in, uh, take the place between the uh, mercy seat there. You won't be here for that. Amen. So that passage is giving you an upcoming event, and he's telling them this. Listen, the rapture would have already happened, or you'd be seeing this stuff take place. Why? They're being taught they're going to go through the tribulation, like a lot of preachers are teaching nowadays. You're going to go through the tribulation. You're going to go through the tribulation. You're going to have tribulation, but you're not going through the tribulation. Amen. Notice what he says. Remember you not when I was yet with you? I told you these things. Paul said, why are you panicking now? I told you. You're not even going to see this stuff. Verse 6, and now you know what withhold it. That he, that's 666, that's the man of sin right there, the Antichrist, the son of perdition, might be revealed in his time doesn't say it to be revealed to you. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, and he that now letteth will let until he, that's the man of sin, be taken out of the way. That's when uh, Satan's taken out of the way. Well, am I going to see that? You're not going to be here. Amen. You're going to be up at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll be sitting down to dinner before long, Amen. supper. And when that wicked, notice it's personified, be revealed, the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth the brightness of his coming. That's the second coming. You're not going to be here for that. You'll be coming back with him for that. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and libel wonder, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So the people in the tribulation didn't get it, and many people go into the tribulation and they don't get a second chance. That's not you. That's not the church. Amen. I'll show you that in a minute. That Daniel says it's a time of Jacob's trouble. Verse number 11, And for this cause God shall send them, not you, that strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might believe, uh, be damned, who believe not the truth, that had pleasure in unrighteousness. The unrighteousness there, right there, ladies and gentlemen, has to do with not believing the truth when they heard it. It's not smoking, drinking, and cussing, and homosexuality. They ha heard the truth, had a chance to get out. The penalty for that is, is that the Lord Himself will send them strong delusion. After the rapture takes place, the curtain closes, and they don't get to see it. They'll believe they're right. You say, who sends it to them? God sends it to them. Well, preacher, I just believe. I know you're, I, I know, I know you're better than God. I know, I know that. I know how you think. You wouldn't give God. You, you wouldn't give somebody cancer. You wouldn't let somebody's baby die. You're better than God. You wouldn't let wars happen. You're better than God. You know more than God, right? You forget God's holy, ladies and gentlemen, and you forget that God's ways are not our ways, and His thoughts are far above our thoughts. 
You can't humanize him and try to make sense of that. If we know all things work together for good to them that love God, them that are called according to his purpose, that means that everything that goes along in your life, God says if you're saved, that's verse 29, you're predestinated to be conformed to his image. That means everything that happens in a Christian's life, God says it's for your good. Now I know you don't believe that. It, God says it's good for you. But it's not. that doesn't mean that you like the good. I mean, you don't like the disability. And you don't like the death. You don't like the, the disfigurement. You don't like the divorce. I'm trying to think of some D's there. You don't like the things that go along with that. But it doesn't say that you like the good. It says it works together for your good. That's God's interpretation of what good is. How can a disability work for good? Well, you have an ability to reach other people that others can't. You have an ability to stay out of trouble because you're disabled and can't get in trouble. How can disease do that? It can do the same thing for you. You learn a lot on a hospital bed. You say, it's what God says, isn't it? But see, the mistake is, is that it's, it's your de definition of good. It's not your definition of good. God says it's for your good. Come here, Job. It's for your good. But see, we have a different opinion of that. We look at things different. We get demented because things don't work the way we think they ought to work. We forget. You're not in control of things. God is. And you, can't, you can't just grab a hold of certain promises and things and latch onto those things like, well, because God said it, that settles it, or I'm just going to believe it and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, but if, it may not be how God's fixing it for you. You're just kind of selfish in the verses you pick. Come back, if you will, please, and let me show you something here in Matthew 24. Let's talk about the, uh, the, the judgment of, of the nations. Now, you want, to be, you want to be careful. You say, what are you doing? I'm not warning you about the world this morning. I'm not warning you about politicians this morning. I'm not, I'm not uh, 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 asking you to watch out for uh, carnal Christians. I'm warning you about preachers. False teachers. Amen. Amen. By their fruits you know them. What did that mean? That means not how many people get saved. You've been taught that for years. If you're really saved, you know where's your stringer or fish. The passage that he's talking about there is, you know a false teacher by the people that are following after him. I'm warning you about preachers that are trying to tell you you're going to go through the tribulation. They're getting you prepared for something that's not going to happen. What they should be preparing you for is the judgment seat of Christ. I can tell you you're going there. I can tell you what kind of tribulation you're going to have. I don't know if a bomb's going to fall in the next 15 minutes. I don't know how things could turn around. I got no idea. God's got all that stuff. Well, how come the America's continuing on? I don't have an answer. I couldn't tell you. Why does God let you breathe? Why does He let me breathe? Why did He let me get up this morning? I don't deserve that. But it's kind of a strange thing. We can start thinking for God. When's God going to bring it to an end? I don't know. I hope now. I hope in the next 15 minutes. You say, because I know what's coming is better. No matter how good it is for you now, it can't even touch the hem of the garment of what's going to be. I don't want it to happen now, preacher. I'm comfortable right now. I'm fat, dumb, and happy. Okay, well, that's, that's great. I'm glad. But it still won't touch where you're headed and what they should be teaching you instead of all this doctrinal foolishness they're trying to show you is and prepare you in arguing over being in the tribulation and getting to the point where I, I'm trying to warn Christians, I don't, it's almost like you want to be here for that. What, you think you're going to be Rambo or something? Why do you want to be in that? Has the world not been enough trouble for you as it is than to think, oh man, it would be great if the devil's here. I'm going to be the guy that takes him out. I don't, I don't want that for you. I don't want that for me. I don't want... I'm, I, look, man, that's the... Right now, if the Lord... If I look at somebody that, say, for instance, is disabled and in their right mind but twisted up like a pretzel, and if the Lord said, I think I'll do that to you because it'll work out... Man, I'm telling you what, man, I cringe at that. Amen. To think about the devil being on the throne and, and him being persecuting me. Yeah. If I'm worried about getting twisted up and think about the devil after me, I, I don't... I don't want anything to do with that. You can have it. 
I don't know why people are so convinced they want to get in the tribulation unless there's this element of self-righteousness there. You think you're righteous enough or your, your, your ego is so large that you honestly believe that you can withstand the pressure the devil could put on you and that you won't deny his name. I'm glad I'm not over in Revelation 9 that I have to you know, hold on to the very end and all that kind of stuff and lose my head for my testimony. I've seen what people can do to people. I think I'd fold like a house of cards or like a cheap chair, man. I'm, I'm just telling you, I, I'm, not, I'm not Mr. Bold. What's worse, suppose they're torturing somebody that you really love and care about. And you think you can hold on to that kind of stuff? They should have written about you in Fox's Book of Martyrs, man. You can't even come to church all the time. Too much difficulty, too much problem. You can't even read your Bible every day. And you only pray when you're in trouble. And you think you can be Paul, I mean, not Paul, uh, what's the Pilgrim's Progress? Uh, uh, John Bunyan. You can sit in prison and they come and say, you can't preach and I want you to just, just stop preaching and we'll turn you loose. And he said, nope, I'll let uh, moss grow over my eyes before I quit preaching. And they put him back in there. What was it, 12 years he's in there? That's when he wrote Pilgrim's Progress for just preaching? Not me, man. You're all too bold for me. I don't want to be in the tribulation. One of the benefits of getting saved in this age is, is a pre-tribulation rapture. Stop trying to put yourself in the tribulation. It ain't going to happen. Some of you are going to be disappointed. We, rapture happens. Kind of like, well, I thought we were going to go through the tribulation. <laughs> Lord, could you just send them back down? I don't want to go. Man, you should be thanking God. I don't have to worry about that. All right, in Matthew chapter number 24, and uh, this is one of the things that winds up taking place, and then you'll find the other portion of that uh, where we get together. Look in Matthew 24, verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be dark, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers in heaven and earth shall be shaken. A preacher, that's the Revelation 12 prophecy, and that's the, uh, the sign of the virgin up there, and Virgo is dropping through, so on and so forth. That has nothing to do with that. That has to do with someone in the tribulation period. How do you know? Verse number 30, Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man, not the Son of God, in heaven, and shall the tribes of the earth mourn. Why? You're the elect. Look in verse 31. Well, it's not you. That's His elect. That's Israel. Come to verse chapter 25. Chapter 25, the Son of Man has come, verse number 31, and all His holy angels with Him. And then, he, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and before Him be gathered all... No, it's people. That's the judgment seat. That's the great white throne. I've heard it taught both ways. It's neither. It's the judgment of nations down here on the face of the earth. The judgment of what? Nations. And he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on the right hand and the goats on the left hand. So are you a sheep or a goat? What's the context? That's the judgment of nations. You want me to, to show you the, uh, how you get by the judgment of nations? It's helping the Jew in the tribulation period. You can't be in the passage. You're not going to be here. How could you help the Jew? You're not going to be here. How could you do it? Leave him a baggie with a Bible in it? Well, I don't want to get improperly judged. Well, I'm a sheep or I'm a goat. That's Calvinism. It has to do with nations. I'm going to show you. You ready to get it? Watch. The king shall say unto them, verse number 34, Blessed them on the right hand, the sheep, come ye and blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's not your kingdom. That's a literal, physical, earthly kingdom. Who was it promised to? The Jew, Israel. Watch. Look at, look at the, the works required. For I was a hungered and you gave me meat, and I was thirsty, you gave me to drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. I was sick, you visited me. I was in prison, you came to me. Uh, then shall the righteous answer him, say, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed thee and thirsty and gave thee to drink? Saw thee a stranger, took thee in, naked and clothed thee. And we saw thee sick and in prison and came unto thee. And the king, 
millennial kingdom, shall answer and say, Verily I say unto you, and as much as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, my brethren, who is that? You're his bride, you're not his brethren. Amen. The least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto what? Then you shall say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. See the everlasting punishment in verse 46? Ladies and gentlemen, that's the judgment of nations. That's the ability to be able to get into the millennial kingdom. You're already there. You're already seated with Him in heavenly places right now. Your ticket's already been punched and you're guaranteed to go to the millennial kingdom. These are individuals that have to do something in order to get the right to enter into that kingdom. They don't get a glorified body. They get an eternal body. They don't get a body like Christ and a mind like Christ. That's for you. Now when you get individuals that do that, what is the judgment? The judgment of nations has to do with during the tribulation there will be a time of persecution unlike anything you've ever seen before. Uh, come to Daniel chapter number 9. And when that takes place uh, during that time period, there will be a responsibility and people will be given the opportunity to um, uh, repent, be baptized, everyone in the name of Jesus Christ and receive the Holy Ghost. No. They'll get the opportunity to get saved by grace through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. No, they'll get the opportunity to take care of the Jew, and by works they wind up coming in. Revelation 6, Revelation 12. These are they that had the faith in Jesus Christ. Got to have it. And kept the commandments. What's part of the commandments in, uh, in the tribulation period? Take care of the Jew. Take care of the Jew. Now, you probably know this. You know that when uh, the um, TBN was going around on a regular basis, you know that they would quote those passages to you, giving a cup of water, and they'd show the little indigent people, and I'm for taking care of them, and giving them some water and saying, you're doing this to the least of my people, and you're working your way into heaven. No, you're not working your way. You can't work your way into heaven. You may get a reward for giving them the gospel, but giving them that and quoting that passage, that has to do with the Jew. It has to do with the millennial kingdom and nations being judged during the tribulation. It's not even for right now. Help the Jew all you want to. I'd make a friend of them. I sure wouldn't make an enemy of them. God made an everlasting problem, a promise to Abraham, and one of the promises he said there was, I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. I don't care if you don't like them or don't like them. You better not be saying stuff about them. Amen. I still believe that's a literal, cur a literal blessing or a curse. Right. Yeah. I believe that you should do whatever you can do to facilitate and, and, uh, and to help the Jew out. Well, I don't care for them. I don't like them. Okay, well, just don't be against them. Yeah. Amen. But let me make this to you and let me make it clear and plain. Uh, putting out your political stance for Israel is not as important as putting out the gospel. Amen. Amen. Your position on back in Israel and against Hamas and Hezbollah and ISIS and ISIL and all the other terrorists that come against them, uh, you'd have to go all the way back to the blood be on us and the, upon our children's children and we have no king but Caesar. You'd have to talk about everybody that's been against the Jew, including the United States of America. But what can happen is, is the gospel gets replaced with a political view or a political stance. It's much easier to stand for a nation. You'll catch a lot less flack for that than you will telling people Jesus Christ saves. And if you don't trust Jesus Christ, there's a hell to pay for it. You'll get more flack for that than you will the other. You ought to be careful that doesn't become your gospel message. That's a trick of the devil. I'm for Israel. I'm pro-Israel. You don't see me up here... Uh, you don't see me up here waving that flag and having the Star of David up here. Right. I'm for Israel. I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on whether or not Netanyahu is doing what he ought to do and flooding the things and what about the atrocities that are happening over there. They're at war. Right. You folks don't know anything about that. Right. You don't know anything about having your homeland attacked on a regular basis and right. suicide bombers. You don't, even, you don't know what it's like to grow up under that kind of deal. Right. You're not even qualified to make that kind of a statement. Right. To say, well, I just think they're kind of overdoing it. They didn't start it. Yeah, right. that, that, that stuff wears me out. Yeah. Well, preacher, what do you think about this? I'm out of it. Preacher, what do you think about this? You pull me in it? You're not going to back me off now that you pulled me in it. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, hold on. Uh-uh. No, you don't, you don't get to do that. And then tell me I'm being ungracious. Yeah. Right. And you're being unkind. No, you started it. Right. Yes. That's the, that's the problem when it comes to that stuff. They start it and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well I quit. Uh, no. Uh-uh. 
No, you're just out of ammunition. You ain't quit. You're just self-preserving is what that is. I get wore out with that. And then I'm the bad guy or somebody else is the bad guy when you started it and you kept poking the bear. And then all of a sudden the bear rises up and says, I've had enough. And the she-bear comes out and knocks out. Oh my Lord, look at the, the people that got killed. Oh, oh my. See? See? You're blaming the bear. You forgot all about making fun of the preacher. Now the bear's the bad guy and God's the, God did wrong. He didn't start it. Why didn't God stop the, the war? He didn't start it. Why does God let death go, continue to go the way it is? He didn't start it. You threw the pebble in the pond, you don't get to all of a sudden go, oh, okay, let's, let's take away the ripple effect. Uh-uh. It doesn't work that way. And if you teach your kids that way, you're teaching them a compromise. You're saying it's okay for people to take advantage of you, and then when you finally decide you've had enough, uh, you, you go ahead and be, be, you be gracious as long as you can be gracious. But after a while, as kindly as possible, sometimes people have to be put in their place. Be careful about using God and the Bible and your position in Israel to try to use your own or, or, or to raise your own position or your own agenda. You want to watch that. That's the same as abortion. I don't believe in abortion. I don't, I don't believe in it. I don't teach that. But I'm not going to go marching for a pro-life thing. You say, why? Jesus Christ is the most important thing. I don't believe if a woman had one, she can't be forgiven. That's for you people. You're, you know, people are wicked and ungodly for all the sins you don't commit. That Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ cl cleanses yes. from what? Oh. Even, even the ones you don't commit. Oh. That's the ones you pick on. Amen. Divorce, that's a good one. Amen. And abortion, that's another one. Okay, well, maybe I better stop right there. But I'm not for that. But don't hide your agenda behind some biblical, scriptural kind of a thing. I mean, if that's the case, you've got verses of Scripture up there in the United Nations. Why the devil quotes Scripture. You ever recognize how much Scripture he quoted when he's in Matthew 4 with the Lord and the temptation? He's quoting Scripture all through the thing. You want to be careful about that. What's the most important thing? Your fellowship with Jesus Christ. What's the second most important thing? Telling other people about it. And be careful about trying to get involved in politics and all this foolishness that goes around. They're playing you like a stinking violin. They don't want anything to do with you until all of a sudden it's to their benefit. That's wrong. And you have to be... I, I had to stop. Daniel. Daniel chapter number 9. I can't say half of what's going on in my brain. Uh, there, 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 I, I, I'm going to just say this carefully as I possibly can. There's a point in time, ladies and gentlemen, when a man or a woman has taken it and taken it and taken it and taken it and taken it, and then all of a sudden they say, I've had enough, and then all of a sudden they're the bad guy. Well, you know what's going to happen when the Lord comes back? He's taken it and taken it and taken it and taken it and taken it. And when He comes back, no quarter. And you know what? People are going to accuse Him of being so mean and so hateful. And He's just a slaughter fest and He's killing. You know how many people had to take to run uh, blood that deep? You know what He's going to do? I don't care what you say about me. You've been talking about me for 2,000 years now. I've had enough. You ought to want to be on the right side of that. But you get this idea that the Lord should just let you go. Isn't that how you feel about sin? You realize He's taken it and taken it. Do you realize what He took to forgive you and I of sin? If you did, you'd pause before you do it. It cost him something. And then he has to take it. He has to take it. But eventually, you know what happens? The judgment seat of Christ happens. 
Amen. And all your motor mouths have to come up and give answer to him. You got all the answers right now? You think you know everything about everything right now? And you're going to get up there and the Lord said, you know this? Well, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have said, well, did you know that? Why? Well, I sure didn't know. Well, did you know? Well, Lord, you know, <laughs> the terror of the Lord comes at you, and what are you going to say? Now, now, wait a minute, Lord, you're gracious and merciful. Yeah, that time's passed. That's it, yep. Amen. You're going to watch God come down eventually on this nation. Yes, sir. Yeah. Whether you're here or not. And if we wind up getting killed in it, we get it in eternity. But God, the righteous judge, comes down and judges. You, you being here doesn't prevent him or stop him. And if he all of a sudden says, today's the day, good. Then when you're done, he'll take you out of here. But in the meantime, the only reason maybe it is that he hadn't come is because of some of you. But when I look at my life, I'm thinking, he shouldn't postpone it for me. I don't deserve to live another day. Who do I think I am? I deserve to live another day. What foolishness. I wish I was as vehement at defending him as I am defending my own self and my own reputation. There it is. I, I wish I had that gear in me, man. That I'd be like a bull in a china closet to defend him, be as quick to defend him and his righteousness as I am my own personal agenda or my prejudices or I'll even say my preferences. I just like it. I just like it. I'm so wore out with, do they like me? Do they like me? Do they like? Is it right? Some people aren't going to like you. You say, why? Because they ain't right. Amen. And that's okay. I think if I remember the Lord said that to the apostle one time, I think he said something about, I have some enemies and uh, you don't have any. And he said, so what's wrong with me? How is it you all are able to make all these friends? No, you know what he said? What's wrong with you? You're befriending the wrong people. I'm going to do my best to stay on his side. Amen. And I hope and pray it doesn't cost me friends and family and everything else, but I'm going to do my best to stay on his side. Amen. But be in the tribulation, I don't have to worry about that. Amen. We're talking about judgment of nations. Now, if you want to treat the Jew nice now and do the nice things for nice people and all that kind of a deal and all, you know the greatest thing you can do for somebody right now? You can lead them to Jesus Christ. You know why? Because after you lead them to Jesus Christ, they get a promise in Philippians 4. You know what that promise is? That promise says, I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. They got a bad habit with dope or with heroin or cocaine or liquor or pornography or laziness or gluttony or whatever. I can do all things through Christ. They can't do it without His help. If the Bible's right, is it right? It's right, sir. So that means if whatever you want to do, God will help you do it. What's the problem? Preacher, I just can't read my Bible. Every I can do all things through Christ. Preacher, I just can't tithe. I can do all things through Christ. Preacher, I can't control my filthy mouth. I can do all things through Christ. Preacher, I can't control my thought. I can do all things through Christ that strengtheneth me. The best thing you can do to help somebody out of their poverty-stricken ways is introduce them to Jesus Christ and say, now listen, God can give you the gear to work your hind end off and to make enough money to provide the way you ought to because He put in the Bible, He that provideth not for His own is worse than an infidel. God will give you a job, but you've got to get saved. But you don't get saved to get a job. You get saved to get out of hell. Amen. And this all this humanitarian aid and all this millions of dollars getting pumped into things like that. Yeah, we need money for the building. We need money to finish the building. You say, why? Because we're going to knock back the crime in Jacksonville. We're going to knock back the, the poverty in Jacksonville. We're going to knock back the hungry people in Jacksonville. We're not building it for that. We're building that for the purpose of encouraging Christians and seeing lost people saved. I'm, I have the solution for them. Plug them into the power. What is the power? I plug them in the wall. What do I do? I give them Jesus Christ. There's nothing more important. There is no reason for another cotton picking building in Duval County if it's not to get. I don't need. I don't need a federal funded money to put out some things over here and give everybody uh, uh, hygienic materials and give everybody food and give out MREs and uh, make sure that we give them socks and all. No, I need to give them Jesus. Now, if you give them that stuff along with the other, that's fine. But don't give it to them. Do you give them Jesus? They'll misuse it. You say, how do you know that? Your government does that. How's that working out for you? 
They give them stuff all the time. If that's the answer to the problem, ladies and gentlemen, why then is the crime rate going through? Why is the, the birth rate going up? Why is we have more children born out of wedlock? Why do we have more single mamas and deadbeat dads? If, if the answer is just give them stuff, no, you need to give them Jesus. And once you give them Jesus, they have an opportunity to be able to fix the wrong mindset. But you can't expect that out of people that don't have that gear. Some of you don't plug into that, I can do all things through Christ, because you don't realize that's a promise to you that are saved. You got a bad attitude? Do you want to quit it? I can tell you why you don't quit it. You don't want to. The Bible says you can do all things. Well, I'm justified in my bad attitude. Okay, good. Take it up to the Lord with you then if you're justified in it. But if you want to quit it, you know what? I can do all things. You have to activate it. Lord, I can't do this on my own. I need you to help me with this. Help you with what? Whatever it is. Put it down right there. Now, Lord, I know that's what you want me to do. You know what I'm going to preach on this morning? I hope you come for the morning service. I hope Sunday school doesn't run you off. You know what I'm going to preach on this morning? I'm going to preach on the number one sin of Christians in America. You're in your mind, you're thinking, I know what that is. I guarantee you it's something you're not doing. I guarantee you it's what you think somebody else is doing. I'm talking about the sin of Christians. I'm not talking about the world. You're not going to hear a single thing about homosexuality this morning. If you're a Christian and doing that, <laughs> yeah, God's going to be laying you low here before long anyway. You'll self-destruct. You do know Christians uh, have children that die, don't you? Sure. Yeah. Sure. You do know that Christians get in debt, don't you? Yeah. Christians file bankruptcy. You know that, right? Sure. You know that Christians wind up divorced. Sure. Sure. Right? You know that Christians wind up with diseases. Yes. Sure. You do know that, don't you? Yes. Sure. Just being a Christian doesn't solve your problems down here. Yes. It solves your eternal problems. Yes. If you're coming here for some kind of socialistic warfare or social medicine or some kind of psychological slop, you're in the wrong place. Amen. So what am I going to do? I'm going to give you the answer to your problems in eternity mm -hmm. and somebody to walk with you while you still have your problems Amen. down here. Amen. Every one of us is as messed up as a soup sandwich. Amen. Every one of us is as messed up as a soup sandwich. You're measuring yourself among yourself and, and thinking, well, I'm better than so-and-so. You ain't better than him. Amen. You see yourself in His light. You know what you do? You recognize, man, you got to be kidding me. God sure has been good to me. I better just shut my mouth. I'm going to preach on the number one sin in Christianity today. You say, you know what it is? I believe I do. Come to the church service. We'll see if, if I'm right about it. Daniel chapter number 9. Look in verse number 24. Talking about the tribulation. Seventy weeks are determined upon... Thy people, who? And upon the holy mountain, a holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision of the prophecy, to anoint the most holy. Seventy weeks are determined upon His people. That's Israel. Okay, if your Bible come a little further, come to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel 12. So during the tribulation period, the predominant reason for that is not to just punish wicked America and wicked other countries. It's to finish the transgression that started with Daniel. 69 or maybe even 69 and a half weeks have already transpired and taken place. And as a result of that, what people miss out is, is that it'll be tribulation on the entire earth, the entire world, but it is predominantly to continue to punish the nation of Israel for their rejection of their Messiah when He came, God in the Old Testament, and the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 7. That's pretty prejudicial, isn't it? I mean, how dare Him just punish His people? Shouldn't He punish the world? Well, you'll get collateral damage as a result of it, but the 70 weeks are determined upon His people to finish the transgression because they did it. God said, the cup's not full yet. I stopped to put in the church age and now i got to finish that. Right. And it's against Israel. That's why by the time the tribulation is over with, with the exception of who's in the red rock city there of Petra, probably less than 3,000, other than the 144,000 male virgin Jews that are sealed with the mark of God in their forehead and Moses and Elijah and whoever their converts happen to be. But as far as the nation of Israel is concerned, that thing will be down to such a small, minute remnant by the time you get in there, there won't be any of them left. They'll be eating them in the tribulation and drinking their blood. See, it could never be that wicked. You, you wait till the devil's ruling and reigning. It'd be a whole lot more wicked than you are now. But here's the thing you want to recognize. That's against Israel. That's not against you. You don't want to be His people. 
No, you don't. You want to be His bride. You can't be saved if you're His people by keeping the law. You have to be saved by grace through faith. You know how hard that is for a Jew? You know how hard it is for a Jew to recognize that he has to accept a gift? A Jew doesn't want to take a gift. He wants to earn it. And he'll earn it. I mean, they're smart. They'll outwork you. Look, if you will, here. Let me give you this one more verse and we'll take a a quick break here. (laughs) Daniel chapter number 12, verse 1. At that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people... Remember over there in the book of Revelation where he says, Michael, uh, he shall descend from heaven of the shout of the archangel, the trump of God. Right? Right. That's Daniel. I mean, that's Michael. He stands for the nation of Israel. You're going back into the tribulation there and taking care of that stuff. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since the nation, since there was a nation, even that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, and some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that be, uh, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and the knowledge shall be increased. After the rapture, they'll get the rest of it. After the rapture, the revelation will begin to come out. After the rapture takes place, the Lord will begin to reveal things like He did through Moses and Elijah and through the 144,000 male virgin Jews. What is the time of the judgment of nations? It is a judgment where individuals in the tribulation are required to treat that Jew with special uh, privileges. You visit them, you spend time with them, you help them, you clothe them, you feed them, and you're judged based on those works. How many you think are going to do it when they find out that those people are ostracized and if you make communion with those people, they'll kill you? How many people you think are going to do it? How many nations you think are going to do that? Why, if you study in World War II, when all of a sudden World War II took place, people were paying to get Jews out of the country. They set up a beachhead on Tel Aviv. Did you know that? You know what it was? When the people were coming in on ships and they were supposed to be returning to their country, you know what England did? England set up concentration camps on the beachhead to, inc- to, to, uh, to uh, incarcerate Jews returning to their own country. You read, don't you? Oh, I thought Churchill signed and with one stroke of the pen, he divided that land. You divided the land, did you? Well, guess what happened to Britain? When they did that, I mean, the sun never set on Britannia, never set on the British Empire. After that, you're what, fifth or sixth down the line now? Britannica rules away? Not anymore, they don't. You say, why? You're going to divide God's land? God's going to divide you up. You don't realize what they did. They're paying people to take people to get them out of their land. Now, you think during the tribulation period people are going to be different? You think it would be easy to do? You take care of a Jew? Man, it will be, it'll be worse for you to do that. How many people you think are going to do that? Well, you don't even do it for each other now. You think you do it for people that are ostracized? I know who you do it for. You do it for people you like. It will be a crime to assist them in the future. It will be a crime to help them in the future. You go to prison, you go, you'd, be, you'd be killed for it in the future. You, sh- you sure you want to live during that time? You think you can do that? Well, if it's against the law, you know, preacher Romans 13. Okay, well, there you've got a biblical principle running against the law. I guess you have to be willing to take it. That's what Paul taught. If I've done something worthy of death, doing what God would have me to do, then I've got to go get the death penalty because they tell me not to preach Jesus. I'm preaching Jesus. And if I lose my life for it, then so be it. There's a point where you got to break from it. But it's not your voting rights. So you want to grab a hold of that. That's called the judgment of nations, and that's not your judgment. You'll be there for it, and you'll watch it. And you'll watch the people come up from those nations, and those nations are going to write out edicts. And uh, they're going to be held accountable, and their governmental officials and the people that voted them in and that kind are going to be held accountable. If you run that thing back to World War II and the Lord were to apply that 
and the rapture could have taken place. And you know what happened? You'd have a bunch of people in there saying, in the name of taking care of the Jew, they killed them. They slaughtered them by the millions. <laughs> Do you know who your ally was in World War II? In Russia. Do you know how many Jews Russia killed? Over 9 million. Where's that in your history book? Everybody talk about the Holocaust and Hitler killing six. What about Stalin? He killed 9 million. He killed over 30 million of his own people. Read it. It's a history book or Google it or whatever you do if you're lazy. God's sake, don't look it up in a book. Make sure you get the kind that you can click it and it reads it to you so you don't have to read it. You know why nobody talks about it? That was your ally. That was your ally against Hitler. Good cause, but it was against God's people. Bad thing. Bad thing. You say, what's going to happen? I'll bless them that bless thee. Curse them that curse thee. You got it coming, America. Father, bless your word and be with us as we uh, get ready to go into the regular service. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, ladies, Miss Carol's out.